Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, today we begin a brand new sermon series on the Gospel of Mark, as you saw, called Following the King. And I, I know I've said this before, but I get so excited every time we start a new series, uh, not only for my own growth, uh, I'll be studying and preparing as those of us who preach will be, but for all of us as individuals and as a church body to dig in together and go on really kind of like a road trip or a journey and thinking about all that God will do in us through this series. And the series is going to take us a better part of a year. We're going to be in the first half of Mark before Advent, and the, in the new year we'll be in the last half of Mark leading up to the resurrection at, of course, Easter. So it's going to be a great journey. We've said all along that we believe our unity here at Chapel Street is in Christ, in Christ alone, not in what's happening in our culture, in the world, or our personal ideas, but in Jesus. And so if that's true, what better time than for us to dig into the gospel of Mark and be unified in who Jesus is and what his life, death, and resurrection really means. So toward that end, we are encouraging you to pick up one of these uh, Mark journals. There's two different versions of them. There's the black plain version, uh, which has lined pages opposite of the scriptural text. And there's the fancy gilded version with little fishies on it that has uh, blank pages opposite the text. Either way, it's the same thing. The pages are the numbers are the same. We encourage you to pick one up, read along, journal along. And as you read and journal, write down the thoughts that occur to you about who Jesus is. That's the main idea. What, what are you learning about this person that we're called to follow, the King, Jesus? So let's pray and we'll jump in together. God, thank you for the way that you love us and provide for us and call us to follow your son, our king, Jesus. Forgive us for the way that we're always, often, trying to supplant him with some other king, even the king of our own hearts. Forgive us for that and help us as we journey in this series to discover afresh who he really is and what it means to be called his sons and daughters. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, years ago, the son of a world-renowned uh, classic scholar, uh, Dr. E. V. Ryu, uh, who was, uh, he was famous for his translation and, and commentary on the, on the scholarly classics of Greek and, and Latin culture, and he, or, uh, excuse me, Latin language, and he was tasked by Penguin Classics to uh, produce a new translation of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. His son said at that time, it will be interesting to see what my father makes of the Gospels. Now, his father, Dr. E.V. Ryu, was a, an agnostic, not a believer. And then his son said, it will be even more interesting to see what the Gospels make of my father. And I thought about that. That's a fascinating statement, and I think it's a profound question for us. The question is not, what will we make of the Gospel of Mark? But what will the Gospel of Mark make of us? As we journey through this, the question is not what are our thoughts and our ideas as if this is some text that we master, but it's the text that masters us. What will Jesus say to us and make of us as we study his word together? This is a question worth reflecting on and praying about, and, and it's it, God asking God, what do you want with me in this series? What do you want to do in my heart? What do you want to change about the way that I think and see the world? the way that I behave. God, what do you have your way with me as I dig into your word and study who Jesus is? Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels, the first written. Uh, it was the unique and distinct literary form that we call the Gospels, or the Gospel. Is the, this is the first one. So we think of Gospel as a unique kind of literature in the ancient world. Mark is the first to write in this style. Uh, the author uh, is named John Mark. Now, he Mark's gospel, most scholars believe, was Peter was the eyewitness source from which Mark got most of his information. And Mark's text, his account, which we're going to study, was the source text for both Matthew and Luke's gospel, which came later. Uh, Mark, John Mark was the author, and John Mark had a bit of a shaky start in ministry and in, in his uh, Christian life. If you don't know the story, John Mark was invited by Paul, the Apostle Paul, on his first missionary journey. And John Mark, for what reasons we aren't told, abandoned Paul. He, he got weary, got tired, got fearful, got frustrated. We're not sure, but he, he walked away from the journey. Paul was so frustrated by this that he refused to bring John Mark on his second missionary journey. And Paul, Barnabas, Timothy, and Silas had a 
falling out, a division over whether or not to bring John Mark. So he didn't have the best start. But we find out later in his life, he's reconciled back to Paul. Paul refers to him affectionately. And he becomes the close confident and spiritual son of Peter. So maybe that would encourage us just to start that here's this person called John Mark who doesn't have a great start, but yet we're reading his gospel today. We're studying the life of Jesus from what God allowed, inspired him to write. Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels, written in the most accessible Greek language of the day. Uh, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is all action, all the time. The word immediately in Greek is used uh, 40 times, over 40 times, while only seven times in the Gospel of Luke, for example. Jesus is immediately doing this and jumping to do this, and it's all action. Mark contains no birth narrative, no long philosophical discourses of, of Jesus. It contains more miracles than either Matthew, Mark, or uh, Matthew, John, or Luke, uh, it, although it's the shortest, because Jesus is always doing. One, one scholar said Mark is the go gospel. Jesus is on the move doing things. He's the action hero of the story, and there's no other hero but Jesus in any of the gospels, particularly Mark. Of course, all of the Gospels deals primarily with the identity of Jesus, which is what we're going to deal with. But really, that's the, that's the question at hand when we come to study the Gospel of Mark. Who is Jesus? The central question is this. Who is Jesus? So as we launch into this series together, I want you to have that question in mind. Who is Jesus? You may think you know. You may think you know from Sunday school lessons as a kid or from the church you grew up in or from what you've been reading on your own, and perhaps your ideas are partially right. My ideas are partially right. At best, they're partially right. But none of us fully grasps yet who he really is. And there's more of him that he wants to give us if we're open to it. So this is the central question we should have in our minds as we read and we study through Mark. Now, we've titled this series, Following the King. And following King Jesus begins by getting clear about who he really is. How can you follow somebody you don't know? And so let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Just one verse in the Gospel of Mark. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. That's the first word in the Gospel. And frankly, it is, it's full of the answer to the question. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. We'll talk about each of those phrases here in turn. The gospel is the Greek word euangelion. It means the good news. The good news or glad tidings or good announcement. Something is being announced or proclaimed. News is being announced. That's really good. Well, what's the news? It's about Jesus Christ, of meaning about, about Jesus Christ. Jesus, the, the Hebrew word Yeshua, is, means God saves. And Christ is the word for anointed one, king. So Putting this together, it's the good news that God's salvation and has come in the, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah. The Son of God is the, meaning the unique Son of God. It's a claim to his divinity. Let me put it to you this way. The good news of the divine king who is the salvation of God. That's another way of saying the same thing. Who is Jesus? He's the one who came to pronounce the good news that the salvation of God is present in him, the divine king. If this is true, and it is, then what does it mean to follow this king? What does it mean for us to follow him as our king? This is precisely what this whole series is all about. And if we look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we see Jesus himself is proclaiming this very announcement, the answer to the question. Now, after John, that's John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, there's the good news again, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So once again, we see Jesus is coming to proclaim something. He's, he's got an announcement to make. In fact, in verse 38, which we won't have time to get to, he says, I must go to other towns and preach the gospel there, for that is why I came. If I ask you, why did Jesus come on earth? We would say, well, he came to give his life as a ransom. We'll see that in Mark chapter 10. He came to serve, not to be served. We'll see that throughout the gospels. Uh, he came uh, that, that we might be set free and have life to the full. That's in John 10. Many reasons that are biblical we could answer. But in Mark's gospel, one of the reasons which we don't think about much that Jesus says he came is to proclaim something. 
to announce something, to be in himself the announcement of the gospel, the good news of, of the kingdom of God. And gospel and kingdom go together. The king is telling us about the kingdom that's present in him. This is crucial. Preaching, announcing, declaring. It's the Greek word caruso. It's to be a herald or to declare something. This is really important for us. In fact, the good news, again, is the Greek word euangelion. It's where we get our English word evangelism and evangelical. Now, I'm going to guess when you hear the word evangelical, you think about something different. It's, a, uh, it's often talked about as some kind of right-wing voting block or something that means something political these days. Uh, I've had people say to me, well, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I follow Jesus, but I'm not an evangelical anymore. What's an evangelical? In our culture, that word is up for grabs. It's being reinterpreted, and people are kind of commandeering the narrative to make it mean different things. But fundamentally, it means people of the evangel, people of the good news. So I want to say I'm an evangelical if, because I'm a person of the good news. I'm a person of the good news of King Jesus. That's what it means. Don't let someone tell you different. In the ancient world, the evangelion, the, the, the good news, the gospel, often was an announcement about a king, that a king was born, that a king had a great victory, that a king had come. Jesus, who is the king, comes proclaiming the announcement of his kingdom, which has arrived in his person, King Jesus. So when he comes on the scene, his first words are about the good news of the kingdom, that the king has come. You know, the story of this world, really, if you think about it, is a story of a clash of kingdoms. Because if it's true that the kingdom of God has come, and if the kingdom of God is Christ's reign, wherever Jesus is reigning on earth, then it's not hard to look around the world today and think, well, it doesn't look like God's reigning over there. I don't feel like God's reigning over there. What about Afghanistan? What's happening in parts of the world where it's God reigning there? Is that the reign of Jesus? It doesn't look like it. It doesn't feel like it. And the truth is, the kingdom of God is not the only kingdom at work in this world. The will of God is not the only will operating in this world. There is a clash of kingdoms. And the question is, who's going to win? The Bible's answer is, God is going to win. And he's going to accomplish that victory in his son, Jesus. But it's not going to be accomplished in any, the way that anybody imagined or would have predicted or would have thought. So notice, the gospel of the kingdom is something Jesus proclaims and preaches. He announces I, my observation about our culture is our culture has largely lost confidence in the power of the proclaimed truth. People are, are down with service. They love compassion and service ministries. People who aren't believers in Jesus even, like that we're doing charity work or justice work or work to care for the poor, that's popular. We're okay with that. But as soon as you start to proclaim the truth of why, the one in whose name we're doing these things, and that he is the way, the truth, and the life. People get very nervous about that in our culture today. Uh, you know, proclaim the truth. But Jesus comes on the scene, and his announcement about why he came is to proclaim something to you, to tell you something, something fundamentally, profoundly true about who God is and about what he wants with your life. Jesus says he came to proclaim, to preach the good news that he is king and he is the way to salvation. Now, I know for some of you, this is, this is not new. But I think for many of us, the most profound things in our life are not, it's not new information. It's what we think we already know to, to get from our heads deep into our hearts, to penetrate our whole lives. The Apostle Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. There's one message. There's one king. And it's a message that you, you can demonstrate with acts of service, but you cannot proclaim unless you're using your mouth. I mean, there's a nonverbal communication, right? I can say certain things to you nonverbally. I can give you a look that will let you know that I'm, I'm displeased or I'm happy or, you know, you can read my body language and my facial expressions. But that only goes so far. Like, I could tell you I don't like you with my look or I like you or I'm, I'm surprised with my look, but I couldn't tell you, hey, meet me in the parking lot at 6.15. We're going to go to Chili's for dinner with a look. I have to use words to do that, to be specific. And the gospel is something to be proclaimed. Yes, lived out and demonstrated, but ultimately preached told, shared, proclaimed about who Jesus is. Here's the question. Do we trust Jesus to work through his word? Do we really trust Jesus to work through his word? Or do we think he needs our help a little bit? Do we want to soften it or, or package it? Or do we just trust him that his word is powerful and when he speaks, things happen? 
Do we have confidence in the power of the word of Christ proclaimed? You know, as a pastor, I'm, I'm repeatedly reminded that I cannot possibly meet all the needs of the people in our church, in our community. I, cannot, I can't even meet the needs of my own family. I'm not able. I'm limited. I'm finite. I'm fallen, and so are you. And I know you feel that way in your own business, in your own family, in your own life, that the needs and the, and the, the responsibilities can be crushing and overwhelming. All I can do is point people to Jesus, is bring them to him, and trust Jesus to work through his word. I remember John Kelly who preached in our, he's a pastor at Chicago West Bible Fellowship in the Austin neighborhood in the west side of Chicago and he came and preached at our church uh, several, several months ago and he told his story at the end of his sermon about how he came to faith in Christ in prison by reading the word of God. That a prison guard who he said he'll, he's never met since, well, he'll meet him in heaven, gave him a Bible and the power of the word itself transformed his heart and he began to grow. I met with a man recently who was trying desperately to put the pieces of his life back together. He's made a mess of things, an awful broken mess of his marriage and family. And he's desperately trying to do all the things necessary to put it back together. And he's, he's asking me almost for the list. Just tell me, Pastor, what do I have to do? I'll do whatever it takes. And it's hard for me to explain to him, it's not a checklist. What he needs more than the list of things to do is full surrender to Jesus as his king. And Jesus will put the pieces back together because he can't and I can't. Only Jesus can. So realizing that I cannot fix what's broken inside of you or, or myself or anybody else, only Jesus can is part of what it means to follow this king. Friends, this is why we want to make Christ central and his gospel central to everything that we do, to our worship, to our preaching, of course, to our compassion. If you visit Shepherd's Heart and talk to Erin Wise, uh, she'll tell you or any of our volunteers will tell you that, yes, we provide food. Yes, we provide counseling. Yes, we provide budgeting teams. Yes, we help resources come to bear on people's physical needs. But fundamentally, the primary reason is so that they could come closer to Jesus because only he can fix what's really wrong, what's really broken in any of us. And this is why our mission in our service, our students, our kids, our men's, our women's, our groups, all of our ministries should be centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. All centered on him. Okay, because here's the key thing. When Jesus speaks, things happen. You're going to see throughout the gospel of Mark, when Jesus says, speaks, when he addresses people, when he confronts and speaks, his word has power and things happen. Do you believe this really? I mean, for a minute, just stop. Do you believe that when Jesus speaks, things happen? We see it over and over again in the Gospels. This is true from the very beginning of the story of God. In Genesis chapter 1, let there be light, and there was light. And John 1 tells us that that word, that creative word, was Jesus, the word made flesh, that God, Jesus was there in the beginning. The, he is the word that brings things into existence. So it shouldn't surprise us that when he shows up in the flesh, Jesus of Nazareth, that when he speaks, things happen. The living Christ is a God who speaks, and when he speaks... Things come to life. Things happen. One word from God can change your life. You believe that? A lot of words from a lot of other people can confuse you and mislead you and overwhelm you, but a, a single word from the living God can change your life. Let's look at verses 16 through 20 and see what happens when Jesus speaks in the life of those who have chosen to follow him. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, that's the key phrase, Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately, there's that phrase which shows up over and over again, they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So we see Jesus walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, seeing two brothers, Simon and Andrew, two sets of brothers. And I, I often wonder, were Simon and Andrew and James and John, were they, were they rival businesses? Like if you lived in that part of the Sea of Galilee near Capernaum, could you get your fish from Simon and Andrew or Zebedee and Sons? Like what, was it that way or did they work together? We're, we're not told, but they're, they're fishermen in the same region. And Jesus speaks to them. He calls out to them to follow him. And the first thing I want you to see is that when Jesus speaks, ordinary people follow him. They're fishermen, which means they're 
middle to low, lower class. They're not highly educated. They're very, very ordinary in that society. Jesus says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. It's probably a familiar phrase to many of you. You've heard that before. But I want you to think about the order. Jesus speaks, follow me, and I'll do something with your life. Follow me, and I'll make something of your life. It's not make something of your life, then come and follow me. Get your act together, then come to me. It's, it's, remember when Jesus shows up? He says, repent and believe the gospel. Repentance means to turn, to leave something behind. Believe, trust the key, that, he's, that he's true and he's real, and follow him. So whatever it means to follow the king, it begins with repentance and belief. And we see that here in James and John's example. They leave their nets and follow him. Now, when you, when you read, it almost sounds like Jesus had some sort of weird Jedi mind control over them. Follow me. Uh, I must follow Jesus. Like, they just leave everything. It, sound, it reads almost strange, but that's not what's happening. He's a rabbi who believes in them. These are unschooled, ordinary men who can't believe somebody believes they have what it takes. The call of Jesus compels these ordinary people to follow. And that has happened then, and it still happens today. It's happened in my life, where Jesus said, calls to me, follow me. Maybe it's happened in your life. You've heard the call of Jesus through his word, in your own heart, through the spirit. And you know that following him means I got to leave something behind. Following Jesus doesn't mean fitting him into your already busy and full life. It means leaving something. We see it there when they're in their, 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 leave their nets. They leave their families. They leave their old way of life. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who Jesus calls to follow has to change jobs or move their home. But it does mean following the king means you're going to leave something behind. What is that for you? What is Jesus calling you to leave behind? What does he ask you to walk away from if you're going to follow him? He's not asking you to make a little space for him to come into your already busy and full life. But to, to leave everything, be willing to, surrender it all, and follow the king. When Jesus speaks, ordinary people follow him. When Jesus speaks, ordinary people follow him. And then we look at verses 21 through 28. We see that he's so compelling, other things happen. And they went into Capernaum. This is the city, Peter's hometown. I've actually been to Capernaum. It's an amazing archaeological site. And there it is, the word again. And immediately, on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he's taught them as one who had authority. That's an important phrase, as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately, you see how it's just always action in Mark's gospel? There was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Whoa, stop there for just a minute. This is, a, this is the demonic powers recognizing the person and the authority of Jesus. And when others don't yet, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. What have you come for? What are you up to? What are you doing? The demons are asking the question we should be asking. In fact, we read in the New Testament that even the demons know who God is and they shudder. But that's not the same thing as following him and surrendering to him. Very different recognition that he exists is not the same thing as a surrendered life. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him, crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout the, all the surrounding region of Galilee. This is a remarkable story. Jesus calls these ordinary people to follow him, and they do. His, his person, his presence is so compelling that he's worth following, even if it means leaving something behind. And then the next account is in a local town, Capernaum, the synagogue, the place. It was, think about church building, uh, city hall, town hall, public meeting place, all wrapped into one. Jesus is there on the Sabbath day a time when people would gather together to, to hear the word of God read and taught, and he begins to teach. And there's a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. Now, don't get hung up on, on evil spirits. I believe they exist. The Bible says so. But that's not primarily the point here. There's a man in the synagogue who has a deep darkness that's oppressing him. 
But he's been in that synagogue. He didn't just show up that day. He's been in their synagogue. Now, I, I, was, I didn't really think about this before this sermon. He's sang the songs. He's read, heard the scriptures read. He knows the prayers. He's been there day after day. And yet, he's not set free. He's not liberated. He's not changed until what? Until Jesus speaks to him. Until Jesus, King Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy One, comes on the scene and addresses him and speaks to him, things happen. This is the second thing that I want to mention. When Jesus speaks, broken people are made whole and troubled people are set free. When Jesus speaks, ordinary people like you and me follow him with our life. Imperfectly though we do, we respond to him and follow. And when Jesus speaks, broken people are made whole and troubled people are set free. This man's in the synagogue and not changed. I think there are people in the church today, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, who are not changed because they have not heard Jesus speak to them or they're not listening. Because when Jesus speaks, things happen. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20 that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk but of power. It's not just words. That's happening here. This is what the people say. What kind of teaching is this? That this, the evil spirits obey him. This is not what we've heard before. This is not just f philosophical talk here. Something different. In fact, you might remember when they said before the, the healing of the, the casting out of the unclean spirit, they say he teaches differently than we've ever heard, like someone who had authority. What does that mean? All, all human authority is derived authority from your title, from your education, from your, the people's, you know, granting it to our elected leaders, from government. All human authority comes from somewhere else. My authority does. Yours does if you have it over your family or whatever. It's coming from somewhere. Someone's giving it to you or it's, it's, it's acquired in some way. But with Jesus, when he taught, it sounded and felt different. He wasn't getting it from somewhere. He himself is authority. He's authoritative. And he, so when you hear him teach, it's like, this is not, this is different. Like all rabbis would, would build on the teaching of the rabbis they came before or whose school they taught in. And they, they would talk about, you've heard rabbi so-and-so say this, and they would build on that. Jesus, remember the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said X, but I tell you. I don't need anyone else's authority. It's not based on anything. He is authority. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. And that's what the people felt and sensed when they heard him teach, which is what he came to do, he said, to proclaim something. Ordinary people follow him. Broken people are made whole. Troubled people set free. But wait a minute. You might be saying to yourself, okay, that's fine. I, I think that's true, at least as far as these stories go. But I can think of some stories in the Bible, maybe you can, where people didn't get healed where people encounter Jesus and they didn't respond to follow him, where they didn't uh, have their lives changed. For example, the rich young ruler. We're told he goes away sad because he had great wealth, which Jesus calls him to walk away from. Or the Pharisees, who are constantly confronting him. Not everyone who meets Jesus gets changed. And that's still true today. There are many, many of you, many people, who have come day after day and haven't really been changed. So what do we make of this? How do we understand this? Well, Whenever Jesus directly confronts a person or a power, things happen. You never see an account in the Gospels where Jesus is trying to cast out a demon and he can't do it. The disciples have that issue, but not Jesus. You never see an account in the Gospels where Jesus tries to heal somebody and he fails. That never happens. So whenever Jesus directly confronts or calls an individual or confronts a power, what Jesus declares or decrees or determines, it happens. But not everything that Jesus does is a declaration. In fact, many, very often we see an invitation, an opportunity. And in those cases, there's an opportunity to respond or to reject. And I think that's true today as well. But if we do respond to the king who speaks, if we do surrender and follow him, we will see that his word has power to change us and those around us. Ha have you had this happen in your life? Have you come into contact with the Word of God spoken to you? Have, maybe you've been around, maybe, you, maybe you've had the experience like I have, where you've read something in the Bible dozens of times, hundreds of times even. You've heard it, you've sung it, you've seen it, and it never really penetrated. Intellectually, you knew it. Maybe you even thought you knew what it meant. But suddenly, 
at a certain point in your life, it comes alive to you. It's like a bolt out of heaven, like a hammer blow to your heart where you're torn open, you're broken open, and you see Jesus in a way you never saw him before. You hear God speak directly to you through his word, which you've read a thousand times. What's happening there? Has God's word changed? No. But we have. <laughs> We've gone through some disappointment, some experience, some pain, some question. Something is cracking us open that God is doing so that we could hear God speak to us through his living word. Jesus said, I came for that purpose, to proclaim something, the good news, that the king has come. And when we hear it, our response, again, is to repent, to believe, and to follow him. Allegiance to Christ and Christ alone. We call this series Following the King because it's crucial that we understand what we're, what we're advocating here, what we're talking about here, what we're after here is allegiance to Jesus Christ alone, chief above all other allegiances. I don't like labels and titles. People, it, it, um, Soren Kierkegaard once said, if you label me, you can dismiss me. If you put a label on somebody, you can say, well, well she's one of them. Oh, he believes that. He's one of those. He's one of them. And that's happening all over our culture today, isn't it? The only label I want is the label of Jesus. I want to belong to him. I want that label, and I hope that's the one you want as well. You know, when I was in college, at Wheaton College, I had a, a professor that made a huge impact on my life named Lyle Dorset. And I remember one particular uh, class I came in. I, I, was, I was a late bloomer academically. I'm not the, I wasn't the reading intellectual giant you see before you today. <laughs> All kidding aside, I, it took me a while, but he had an impact on my life. And I remember one class he came in and he, he said, I want to talk to you today about the danger of isms and ists. I still remember the way he said it. I'm like, what is he talking about? Isms and ists. Here's what he meant. Speaking of labels, oh, he, he's a capitalist. She's a socialist. They believe in socialism or communism or liberalism or progressivism. In Jesus' day, there were, there were isms as well. Gnosticism, Platonism, right? Epicureanism, Pharisaism, Stoicism. There were isms, schools of thought that you subscribe to. And here's the temptation, and it's always been there. We want to, to attach isms and ists to Jesus. But our real allegiance is to the ism. I'm a conservative. I'm a progressive. And we're trying to fit Jesus into our ism. And he doesn't fit. There are times, friends, when following Jesus is going to look conservative to some people and progressive to others. But he breaks the categories. And I think today, more than ever before, what's needed for those of us who follow Jesus, particularly in America, is to lay aside all our isms and ists and say, I want Jesus. I want only Jesus. And I want him to determine where, where I go and my, direct my path because he doesn't fit in all the categories the world is trying to force on us. I see it in my own life. I see it in the life of our church. I'm sure you do as well. You don't have to look very hard. So, by the way, this does not mean that following Jesus is some kind of middle-of-the-roadism. That's not what I'm saying. It's not like, well, we'll just kind of find the middle ground. No, he breaks the categories. He's not defined by them. He's something altogether different. And the world needs to see people who follow Jesus and Jesus alone. What does that look like? That's what we're after, this series. Because he is the one who speaks with power to change lives. He is the one who, when he speaks, ordinary men and women, who there's nothing special about us, just respond and follow him. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, Peter and John are on trial before the Sanhedrin, the powerful religious leaders in the land. And they're testifying before them. They're speaking about the gospel and about Jesus, and it's upsetting the Sanhedrin, and they don't understand these men. And verse 13 of Acts chapter 4 says, when they saw the courage of these men, they took note that they were unschooled and ordinary men, but they had been with Jesus. I love that verse. There's nothing special about them. They don't come from special families. They don't have the right background. They're not highly educated. They're not wealthy. They're not high in status in society, but there's one thing we notice. They've been with Jesus. When Jesus speaks, ordinary men and women follow him. When Jesus speaks, broken people get healed, get put back together. And when Jesus speaks, those who are troubled are made whole, are set free. 
We see this over and over again. In fact, we're going to see this in the next couple of weeks in this series. We're going to look at some powerful, miraculous healings. But we're going to keep in mind as we do this that the healings and the miracles, which are all over Mark's gospel, are given for one reason, to point us to Jesus, not to focus on the miracle themselves. Last, I want you to look at one other thing. When, when we come to Jesus and follow him and surrender to him and let him speak to us and begin to change us, not only are we changed, but there's a chain reaction of changed lives that happens. Let's read the last little section here that we'll look at from Mark 20, 1, 29 to 34. And immediately, there it is again. He's, Jesus is always doing stuff. He left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. Remember, Simon and Andrew are the first ones that are called to follow Jesus. Simon and Andrew were the first disciples called. So now Jesus leaves the synagogue and goes to Simon's house. Actually, Peter, Simon's house, has been excavated, and I visited that. It's fascinating to look at. The, they built a church over it in the early 2nd century, and you can visit the ruins of Simon's house th where this story took place. With James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately, there it is again, they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons, and the whole city, that's a key phrase, the whole city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Here's the point I want to make. Simon and Andrew, ordinary guys, but Jesus speaks and they follow. And their lives begin to change. So much so that they invite Jesus into their home. And Simon's mother-in-law gets healed. She had a fever. We're not told she was near death. We're not told this was life-threatening. I mean, of all the things that Jesus had to do, you know, helping his, Peter's mother-in-law get over a fever may not have been, in our minds, the top of the list. But it was to him. Jesus goes into Simon's house and heals one of Simon's and Andrew's family members. And word about this spreads to the town. And the whole town, all those who are hurting and broken and troubled are brought to Jesus. And they're blessed. And they're liberated. And they're changed. How does a city get changed? How does a neighborhood or a community get transformed? How does it happen? Is it magic? Is it socioeconomic policies? Those can help. Is it politics? I don't think so. Fundamentally, how does a street, a neighborhood, a community, a village, a town, a city, a state, a nation, a world get changed? When ordinary people respond to the Jesus who speaks to them to follow him. And when they do that, he changes them. And as he changes them, others are brought to him. That's how it happens. That's at the heart of our vision as the neighborhood church. That ordinary people just trying to respond to the Jesus who calls us by name would follow him faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully. And then we'd see this whole city get blessed because people are brought to Jesus. The pouring out of the power of Jesus on a city or a town begins with two ordinary people responding to his call. Who is Jesus, friends? He's Christ the King, and he came to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And when he speaks, ordinary people follow him. When he speaks, broken people are put back together. They're made whole. When he speaks, troubled people are set free. Are there any ordinary people out there? Any broken people? Any troubled people? The world is full of ordinary, broken, and troubled people. I am one, and so are you. Jesus speaks to you today. Let's pray. Jesus, you are our king, and forgive us for seeking any other. And you're the king who came to proclaim something to us, to announce something to us. That salvation belongs to you. That life comes from you. That freedom and wholeness is found in you. We thank you for this story, this ancient story of what it means to follow you which is profoundly relevant to those of us today, right now. Many of us listening. We're ordinary, we're broken, we're troubled. And yet you speak to us and you call us. Help us by your spirit to trust you to work through your word. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Wow, there were so many things in that sermon 
that stood out to me and maybe want to write down. Some of the notes that I took that, uh, that I really want to remember and think about throughout the day is when Jesus speaks, things happen. Ordinary people follow him. Broken people are made whole and troubled people are set free. Those are words we can continue to reflect on throughout the day and throughout this week. Um, as we go out from here, church, I'd like to bless you with the words. When Jesus speaks, I pray that we would be a people to repent, believe, and follow him. Bless you, church.